Today, we're looking at the air war on the Western Front in 1917. Near the end of 1916, Britain and France had been able to gain the upper hand in the air war against Germany, but by January of 1917, this situation was already being reversed. Britain and France had been slow to exploit their success in the air during the autumn, and persisted in using slow and vulnerable bombing and reconnaissance aircraft. This was done in the mistaken assumption that small numbers of their new flying scouts, patrolling nearby, would provide near supernatural levels of protection. Air fighting tactics were not further developed, other than by individual example, with the result that the Germans were able to gain the measure of such aircraft as the Sopwith Pup and the Newport 17, and in doing so quickly evolved new combat flying tactics. At the start of the year, the new Albatross D3 was starting to arrive at German units. It borrowed some design concepts from the Newport 17, of which several had been captured and sent to Germany for evaluation. This was immediately praised by air crews for its manoeuvrability and rate of climb. However, its full entry into service would be delayed by a serious technical problem. Not too long after the first units arrived, reports began to come in of failures of the lower wing, a defect that had also been present with the Newport 17. The aircraft was of a Cessna plane construction, and the smaller lower wing was struggling to deal with the loads imposed upon it during flight. This problem was corrected, along with the relocation of the airfoil-shaped radiator, but it did delay the full rollout of the aircraft by almost two months. Despite this delayed start, the D3 was to be the most numerous German fighter present during the Arras Offensive, a period of time for the Royal Flying Corps that would become known as Bloody April. At the same time that the Albatross D3 was being introduced, so was the Royal Aircraft Factory RE8, though this did not represent anything like the sort of improvement provided by the D3. It was designed to fill the reconnaissance and bomber role, with the intention that it would be well defended by patrolling Allied aircraft. Despite shortcomings that immediately became apparent, the biggest being that it was actually too stable for effective defensive manoeuvres, it was delivered in ever-growing numbers over the new year to Royal Flying Corps squadrons. Other outdated aircraft, such as the BE-2, FE-2 and the FE-8 were still in service, Promising aircraft like the SE-5, Sopwith Camel and Sopwith Triplane were suffering persistent delays, and the existing complement of Sopwith Pups had not been delivered in as large numbers as their German equivalents, a situation that prompted some heated questioning in Parliament. Efforts were being made to form larger fighting squadrons, with the French forming the Groupe de Chasse, which was composed of the 3rd, 26th, 73rd and 103rd fighter squadrons. However, these efforts did not match those made by the Germans, who had set their sights on creating an impressive force of 37 so-called hunting squadrons, each with 14 aircraft, most of which being the new Albatross models. Despite being referred to as hunting squadrons, the German aircraft almost exclusively operated over their own territory. This defensive approach served several purposes. 1. The Germans were outnumbered by the combined British and French forces in the air, and so conserving their aircraft, and more importantly their pilots, was of the first importance. If a pilot were to bail out, it would be over friendly territory. He could be back in the air the next day in a new plane, rather than being a prisoner of war. 2. The German front line would act as a sort of early warning system. The German fighters would only be deployed when there was confirmed sightings of the enemy approaching their lines. This focus on defensive patrols meant that more fuel was conserved, the airframes would not wear out so fast from fruitless flyouts, and again, most importantly, the pilots would only be in the air when they were absolutely needed. 3. Operating their fighters in this way, in a concentrated manner, allowed the Germans to achieve local air superiority, which thus allowed the individual units a higher chance of victory in their engagements. On the flip side of this, you had the British approach. This approach was far more offensive in nature, and like the German tactics, this served several purposes. 1. The Royal Flying Corps viewed the aircraft as an instrument of tactical support. The army worked on a principle of superiority and offensive action, and as such, any aircraft required to support them would do so in an offensive way, often in the form of reconnaissance missions, artillery spotting, or frontline bombing. 2. 
to achieve the aforementioned tactical support, air superiority would be required. As many of these missions would take place over enemy territory, it would therefore require aggressive incursions into enemy airspace to provide safe airspace for the tactical missions. 3. There was a general agreement within the services of both the Royal Flying Corps and the Royal Naval Air Service that the best defence involved going out and attacking the enemy's air assets at their source, before they could be used to strike at their own forces. This is something that was particularly highlighted by the Royal Naval Air Service, who began the war by striking German airship hangars as early as 1914. The benefits and drawbacks of these two doctrines would be tested during the Battle of Arras. It was the first large-scale offensive on this front since the Battle of the Somme in 1916. The air offensive began several days before the land battle, with the British and French intending to secure total air superiority for the land offensive. This was also done to deny the air to German reconnaissance aircraft, and thus hide the build-up of British and French troops prior to the battle. This air battle became known as Bloody April for the Royal Flying Corps, and this was due to the high casualty rates suffered in the span of a few weeks. During April, the British lost 245 aircraft, with 211 aircrew killed and 108 captured as prisoners of war, whereas the Germans only lost 66 aircraft in the same span of time. This can be attributed to three key things. 1. The British had superior numbers, but not the superior aircraft. The bulk of their planes were outclassed compared to the Albatross D3, with some of them still being the considerably obsolete pusher designs like the Airco DH2. They were also outgunned when it came to their newer planes, with the Newport 17 and Sopwith Pup both equipped with just a single 303 caliber machine gun, compared to the twin 8mm machine guns fielded by the Germans. 2. British pilot training was considerably less organised than the Germans, something that was compounded by the rapid expansion of the Royal Flying Corps, which had grown to over 900 aircraft by the start of the offensive. Germany, meanwhile, had restructured and reformed their air forces, after the painful reversals of the second half of 1916, and a greater emphasis had been placed on pilot training. 3. The offensive nature of the British tactics, and the defensive nature of the Germans, both combined to worsen the problems mentioned in the previous two points. The Germans, operating over friendly territory, were able to mitigate their losses to the detriment of their opponents. The safety net of friendly territory also allowed the German pilots to pick and choose their battles, so that they almost always came in with an advantage. Yasta 11, which was led by Manfred von Richthofen, provided the best demonstration of this tactic, they were responsible for 89 kills, with the Red Baron himself increasing his total from 31 to 52, unseating his old mentor Bolke as the most successful German ace of the war at this time. The mounting British losses forced the Royal Flying Corps to accelerate pilot training, which in turn led to a higher casualty rate even further as the pilots were going into battle with almost no experience. At its absolute worst, the average life expectancy for a new pilot was less than two weeks. Despite the doom and gloom of those numbers, the Royal Flying Corps actually achieved their main objective during the battle. They were able to carry out reconnaissance and spotting missions for the ground troops in the heat of the fight, mostly because the German planes rarely left their own airspace. The heavy losses certainly took their toll, shaking the Royal Flying Corps morale to its core. Indeed, it sparked a series of internal debates that would eventually culminate in the Smuts Report, which would ask whether the Royal Flying Corps should remain subordinate to the British Army and Royal Navy. This itself would pave the way for the formation of the Royal Air Force in 1918. The second half of 1917 would see a rebound for the Royal Flying Corps. Forced by the events of April to take drastic action, they increased the production and deployment of more modern aircraft. In June, the Sopwith F-1 Camel, perhaps the most famous British aircraft of the war, began to make its appearance just in time for the Third Battle of Ypres. Along with the Sopwith Triplane and the Spad 7, the British and French pilots began to claw back the advantage over their German opponents. During this period of time, men like Manock, Bishop, Ball, McCudden, Guinemer, Fonck and Dorme became household names in the UK and France, no less than those of von Schleich, Manfred von Richthofen, and Berthold in Germany. 
Against the new British Camels and Triplanes and French Spads and Newports, the German pilots flew the new Albatross D5 and the Fokker DR1 Triplane. The Germans had developed the DR1 in response to the Sopwith Triplane. The DR1 was designed to emulate the success of the Sopwith, but with the exception of a few specific pilots, three guesses who one of them was, the German triplane would never achieve the same level of success as its British competitor, mostly because it was plagued by structural problems and wing failures, which stopped it being produced in numbers higher than around 300. During 1917, many new and existing fighter aces would rise to further fame, but many would also fall, the hand of fate being indiscriminate with its choices. On the 25th of March, Canadian Billy Bishop claimed his first kill, a German Albatross D3. He would go on to claim 72 kills, making him the highest scoring pilot in the British Empire. Werner Voss would receive the Pour les Marites in April after securing his 24th kill. However, he would not live out the year, though he would go down fighting, engaging six British fighters simultaneously before being fatally wounded on the 23rd of September. His final tally sat at 48 kills. British ace Edward Manock would claim his first victory on the 7th of May, and on the same day, Albert Boll, perhaps the poster boy of the Royal Flying Corps, was killed, 20 years old and with a tally of 44 victories to his name. Two days later, René Fonck would shoot down six German aircraft in a single day, something he would repeat again in September. Luck always seemed to be with him, and he would survive the war with 75 kills to his name, the highest scoring French pilot. His fellow countryman, Georges Guinemer, would claim four victories in a matter of minutes that same month, but unlike Fonck, his luck, like many, ran out in 1917, when he goes missing in action in September of that year. 1917 was the year when Manfred von Richthofen would earn many of his 80 victories, but he too had an unlucky stroke and was almost killed in June when a bullet grazed his head. He survived, but he was never quite the same again. For all of those aces' singular achievements, usually the product of the pilot's preference for lone patrol and single combat, the strategy of air combat itself was undergoing change, and the era of combat between formations of planes rather than individuals had well and truly dawned by the middle of the year. In June, the German Air Force brought together four fighter squadrons, Jasters 4, 6, 10, and 11, to form Germany's first Jagdgeschwader, or fighter wing. This unit would become known as the Flying Circus, thanks to the colourful paint schemes on its aircraft, and possibly because it often moved from place to place for operations in a manner similar to an actual travelling circus. This formation and concentration of large groups of flying fighters would go on to decimate the ranks of British, French, and German aces in 1918. The application of new tactics was not solely limited to air-to-air -air combat, though. The Battle of Arras, though notable for Bloody April, was also notable for seeing the first use of aircraft in the close air support role. On the 24th of April, a German aircraft dropped down to low altitude and strafed a line of British trenches, spraying them with over 500 rounds of ammunition. Over time, this tactic would be improved upon, and during the Battle of Passchendaele, it would be used to great effect, with close air support aircraft escorted by fighters attacking British groups with machine guns and small bombs. Like the Germans, the British and French pilots also learned the art of providing close air support. These tactics were developed and improved during the protracted battle at Ypres. Initially, the first examples were haphazard strafing runs against trenches and forward airfields, but over the course of the year this would evolve into a cohesive support strategy. By the end of the third battle in November, the Royal Flying Corps had actively provided coordinated ground support, strafing targeted enemy trenches and dropping bombs on strategic targets in cooperation with ground troops. Speaking of bombs, 1917 would see the first large-scale use of heavy bombers in warfare. Germany operated the Friedrichshafen G3 and the Gotha 4 and 5. The Gothas in particular would go on to become one of the most famous bombers of the war. The emergence of the Gotha 4 in late 1916 coincided with the realisation of the Zeppelin's limitations as a raiding platform. These bombers started to make their presence felt on the 25th of May 1917, 
when 21 Gothers, commanded by Hauptmann Ernst Brandenburg, carried out a daylight raid on Kent. At the time, it was the largest daylight raid of the war, and despite 77 British fighters being scrambled, only one German bomber was shot down. 19 days later, the remaining 20 Gothers struck again, this time dropping over 4 tons of bombs during a daylight raid over London. The ineffective response of British defensive fighters led them to conduct a follow-up attack in July, and the growing rapidity of Gotha attacks caused considerable public outcry. However, by August, losses amongst the Gothas was mounting, in no small part because of the rapid improvements to anti-aircraft defences, and the Germans changed to night raid tactics. In light of these raids, and the growing public indignation, a British cabinet committee was formed to combat the Gotha raids. It recommended that an air ministry be formed to coordinate air warfare. Along with the Smuts report, this would set in motion the chain of events that would lead to the formation of the RAF in the new year. On the other side of things, the British would also see the introduction of their own major bombing campaign. On the 11th of October, a new wing, the 41st Wing, was created to carry out strategic bombing of the German industrial heartland. The wing consisted of three squadrons. Number 55 Squadron was equipped with DH-4s, Number 100 Squadron had FE-2Bs, and Naval A Squadron was equipped with Britain's new heavy bomber, the Hanley Page Type O. The wing's first daylight raid was carried out against the German steelworks at Saarbrücken, Two days later, the first night raid was carried out by 9 Handley Pages and 14 FE-2Bs. The first true long distance raid was carried out on Christmas Eve, when 10 DH-4s bombed Mannheim and Ludwigshaven from 13,000 feet. Due to their size, value, and relatively small numbers in 1917, the big Handley Pages would not see significant use until the following year. The emergence of these bombers would kick off a new branch of the aerial arms race that would result in the rapid development of bombing and anti-air technology, but that is a topic that will get its own dedicated video in the future. Along with the first heavy bombers, 1917 also saw some firsts when it came to naval aircraft. On the 20th of May, a Royal Naval Air Service seaplane became the first British aircraft to sink a German U-boat. In more significant developments, progress towards true shipborne aircraft were also being made. In early 1917, two seaplane carriers, the Campania and Manxman, were fitted with takeoff platforms. The carriers then conducted a series of tests. They steamed into the wind, and their Sopwith puffs took off with full speed, in a remarkably short 15 foot takeoff run. This proved the feasibility of the aircraft carrier concept, and over 20 British cruisers would be fitted with takeoff platforms. This would bear fruit on the 21st of August, when Zeppelin L23 was shot down by a Sopwith pup that had taken off from the battle carrier HMS Yarmouth. Taking off from these early carriers was one thing, but for a time there was no actual landing procedure. Pilots were simply instructed to safely ditch their aircraft near the mothership, hopefully not drown, and then be fished out of the water. This would soon change. The battlecruiser HMS Furious was fitted with a takeoff deck, and had facilities for holding six aircraft and four seaplanes under this. In August, Squadron Commander E. Dunning successfully landed a Sopwith Pup on the flight deck, proving that safely landing on a shipborne platform was indeed possible. Unfortunately, some days later when he tried to repeat the experiment, Dunning's pup was blown over the side by high winds and he was drowned. Though tragic, this did not deter the Navy from pursuing the idea, and HMS Furious would go on to conduct the first air raid launch from a carrier in July of 1918. Along with the technological and strategic advancements, 1917 also brought two political changes that would have massive effects on the air war over the Western Front. America's entry into the war, and the Russian Revolution. In terms of the air war, the full effects of these events would not be felt until the following year, but I want to briefly touch on the American side of things. As mentioned last time, I'll be covering Russia with a video on the Eastern Front's air war. Within days of the American declaration of war, Billy Mitchell, often referred to as the father of the United States Air Force, became the first American officer to fly over the enemy lines in an aircraft but America had a long way to go in its military aviation development. 
At the time, the United States Air Service was in its infancy. It was merely a section of the US Signal Corps, with a contingency of 132 officers and just over a thousand men. Of this, only 26 of them were qualified pilots. This would, of course, gradually change over the course of the year. In June, the USAS became the airplane division of the Army Signal Corps. The first air units to arrive in Europe would be the elements of the US Navy's aeronautical detachments, and this would be followed up later on by the first aero squadron of the Signal Corps airplane division. The majority of 1917 would consist of training the young American pilots, with some of this training being provided by the volunteers who had been fighting for most of the war, and it was not until 1918 that large numbers of them would see active combat. 1917 ended with a lull in combat on the Western Front, and the halting of hostilities between Germany and Russia on the Eastern Front. Following the American declarations of war, first against Germany and then Austro-Hungary, Germany responded with the America program, designed to counter the industrial might of the United States. The German air service was to be increased against this new threat, with the creation of no less than 153 additional squadrons. This became even more imperative when the fighting on the Eastern Front ceased, as Germany saw a window of opportunity to try and knock Britain and France out of the war before America's industry got up to speed, at which point they could never hope to match it. This would set the stage for the last and bloodiest year of the world's first major air war.